just two days away from the end of pandemic restrictions in Michigan. Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky is here to talk about that and a controversial package of voting requirements. And how many innocent people are sitting behind Michigan prison bars at this very moment? Two former Detroit TV reporters believe it's way too many. Today is Sunday, June 20th, 2021, and this is Flashpoint. Hi there, welcome to Flashpoint, a very happy Father's Day. And yes, that means you, Bill Skillion, down in Orlando. I hope that's a great day. This coming Tuesday is going to be a great day for the many who've been waiting to drop the shackles of the pandemic restrictions in Michigan. Governor Whitmer moved up her timetable by about a week and a half. For her many critics, it will come as little comfort as they wanted all of the restrictions dropped long ago. That includes the majority leader of the Michigan Senate, Mike Shirky. Whitmer and the Republicans have pretty much been the Hatfields and McCoys of late. She's not happy with a new slate of voting requirements that passed the Senate this week. I've been hoping to have Senator Shirky on for several months now. I'm delighted that he's here today. He's going to join us in just a moment. Also this morning, another conversation I've been eager to have. We have seen quite a few inmates walking out of prison as free men and behind them has been an army of family and supporters and attorneys if you look closely in a number of those scenes you've seen the familiar faces of bill proctor and scott lewis why have these two traded their microphones for work on innocence projects we'll ask them today on flashpoint As we mentioned, on Tuesday, the COVID restrictions in Michigan will lift. Uh, great news to many, but to many others, a lot of why did it take this long? I think it's safe to say uh, that's where my first guest, the camp that he falls into. Great to have uh, the Senate Majority Leader for the state of Michigan, Mike Shirky, with us on Flashpoint. Senator, first off, uh, happy Father's Day. Great to have you here today. Same to you, Devin. I'm happy to be with you, and happy Father's Day. Thanks. Uh, let's start with these, with the, the lifting of the COVID restrictions. You and the governor have been uh, at odds, really, from the drop uh, on, on the way that you think that COVID uh, should have been handled. I think you think this has been too long in coming. There's no question about it, and uh, I think this is a, a vindication of what I've been saying from day one that many steps through the phase of this process, uh, I've been saying we've handled improperly, uh, starting with this notion of herd immunity that we just completely ignored early on, and then naturally acquired immunity and how we have ignored the value of that in the dis assessing when we can open up the state. I said that we could, should open up the state at least two months ago, if not more, because if you add together her naturally acquired immunity, plus those who have received the vaccination, we will well beyond any scientific or medical definition of herd immunity. Yet we continue to wait. And then July 1st was set, and uh, I sent a letter about three weeks ago to Dr. Caldoun uh, laying out my research and, and applying my science based on research. I'm not a doc medical doctor, but I am a trained uh, engineer, and I can read uh, technical documents, and asked her to either dispute what I was saying or open up the state immediately. I didn't get this. We didn't get the state open immediately, but we did get it open sooner. Uh, you, you talk about naturally require, uh, acquired immunity, and that means the people who have had COVID, you had COVID, of course. And uh, but but the CDC and there has been a study from the Cleveland Clinic that suggests that people who've had it don't need to get the vaccine. That is not a part of the CDC's recommendations yet. And I guess as we watch these new variants, especially this very worrisome Delta variant coming along, and we don't know what uh, as, as this disease continues continues or virus continues to to morph and evolve we don't know whether uh, having had it provides immunity down the road as, as the disease keeps changing why not just get the vaccine is the message that you're sending to some is that there's something wrong with the vaccine no not at all but I'm, uh, what are the message I'm sending is that our bodies are created wonderfully and magnificently and we have very natural ability to develop immunity we have for thousands of years and to your question about whether or not naturally acquired immunity will be effective against whatever variant comes along. I will cite this to you, Devin. Uh, to, to date, there have been hundreds of millions of people who have received a, a contract of the infection and recovered. And there was a scant less than 100 in the world who have been reaffected. And most of those have been disputed because of a faulty PCR test. 
However, on the other hand, we're already discovering that some people who have received the uh, vaccinations uh, have been reinfected. And sure. we've also discovered that uh, there's a high probability high probability of those will have to have a booster baby uh, for some of these variants. But, you know, it goes back to the 2003 time period when SARS-1 was in place and people have been tested today, 17 years later, and whether they not had, whether they not they had immunity and T-cell uh, formations for defense, and they all have. And so there's no reason for us to expect that the reaction and natural immunity acquired with COVID-2, COVID-19, excuse me, is any different than that. It, it is still baffling to many that this uh, entire fight has become so politicized, that we've managed to, to, to put politics into medicine and science. A lot of people want to compare what's happened in blue states versus red states. I think the better uh, question is what's happened in our nation versus others. There's really no question that the United States has handled this uh, pandemic disastrously compared with those that we think of as our contemporaries around the world. Uh, as we, If we watch this continue to develop, we've lost so many more people uh, than, than other nations, none of whom uh, locked down less than we did. It was the opposite. What do we do in the future, uh, as Mike Shirky sees? it so what i think what's been missing from the beginning uh devon is any level of transparency and we've had plenty of presentations from the executive office and from the department uh, to the legislature but we've had zero conversations we've had zero opportunity to actually explore uh, test challenge robustly debate some of the claims on science and most of the uh guidance that our department has been following has come from WHO, uh, World Health Organization, NIH, or CDC. And Lord knows how many times they have changed their minds over the last uh, 18 months or so. And so there's been a very serious need for more transparency, uh, more conversation, not presentation. And I'm not suggesting for a moment that we wouldn't have agreed on some of the actions. But to just simply say we're basing on the science, but not allowing yeah. any challenge to those science statements is problematic. Understood. I, I want to make sure we get to a number of other topics. So let's move on. I want to talk about the, uh, the the package of bills that passed the Senate this past mm -hmm. week, uh, increasing voter requirements. There's a lot of people that uh, obviously most people uh, are, are supportive of secure and uh, verifiable elections. But there are a lot of people that are worried about the message that this is sending, that it's basically a solution in search of a problem. And it continues to feed the narrative that there was something wrong with Michigan's elections the last time around. You emerged from that meeting at the White House uh, supporting the Michigan results and uh, uh, kind of speaking against those who wanted to sort of rewrite what might have happened in Michigan. And some believe you're starting to get wobbly on that now. Not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, we've discovered through the process, the Michigan Senate Oversight Committee has conducted a very comprehensive and very robust uh, review of the elections for the last five months. And um, I believe our discoveries and our report, which will come out this week, will indicate that even though I don't, I think that the election results were legitimate, uh, that doesn't mean there weren't a lot of mistakes made through the process. And 70% or 65% of the people in Michigan, regardless of political party, uh, have some questions about the integrity going forward. And one of the first places we have to do, address that in is the a Senator, consistency those were questions, and a the, very the clear message they, on IDs. The questions that, when you say they have questions about those results, those, those questions have been created uh, by a lot of Republicans who are, are still very, we have, we see 53% of the nation's Republicans believe that Donald Trump actually won the last election. And none of that seems to be based based on reality or truth. I agree with that. Michigan's election was clear and concise and, con and conclusive. And uh, jo uh, Joe Biden won Michigan. There's no question in my mind. But that doesn't preclude us from looking at the election process to make sure that everybody has confidence in forego uh, future elections, starting with, and everybody agrees, you should have an ID Across the demographics, there's not one demographic that doesn't agree that ID is an important process of the high privilege and responsibility of voting. Uh, getting a state ID for some is going to cost money, and there are some who, uh, who, who worry that you are in violation of the Constitution in what amounts to a poll tax. Do you see that? Not at all. 
As a matter of fact, I've invited the CEOs and all citizens across the state to join us in identifying all the constraints that are in place for maybe inhibiting or prohibiting people from getting IDs. Uh, Devin, you know for yourself ID. And so not only do we pass laws requiring more uh, robust identification for voting, we simultaneously introduce laws removing many of those obstacles that people are concerned about. And if there are other obstacles, it's incumbent upon the government to make sure they're removed so that nobody should have to worry about access and having an ID. We, we've had it in place where you, if you don't have an ID, you currently have to sign an affidavit. Um, let, let, let's move on to a couple of the topics if we could. Uh, uh, no fault insurance. There, there are a lot of people that believe. I remember okay. still the day with you and the governor and what felt like the entire legislature on the porch of the Grand Hotel, a very celebra uh, celebratory mood in uh, passing no fault. We thought it might be the, uh, the beginning of, a, of an interesting relationship but, uh, of, of bipartisanship between the governor's office and the legislature. Um, we, we now have a bunch of people, though, who are very worried about falling into the gap. People who have been relying on no-fault kind of uh, uh, unlimited care who are about to be thrown into the maelstrom as our law changes. What do we do about those people? So this law was put in place and it was purposeful that we provided a long lead time to, for full implementation. Uh, I can't help the fact that many providers have decided to wait to the last minute to address their concerns and notify some of their patients on what their plans are. But I can tell you that we're not going to make any major changes until it's fully implemented and we see based on actual science and actual data, if there's any changes required, we're not going to base it on speculation. Hmm. There are many, many, many case managers working right now with patients, getting them to the proper resources they need. Ever, all of these folks are guaranteed in law that they have lifetime uh, coverage, uh, just like they have had before, but it may be with a different provider. And uh, we need to let it play out. We need to law let it be fully implemented and then we'll take a look at it after that. I'm curious about your thoughts on the, we, we saw uh, an agreement uh, on the budget, uh, which is, uh, I, I think, uh, great to see. Uh, we, we've got still some disagreement, though, on this idea of uh, the governor wanting to move unemployment money to, and I guess kind of creating it as employment money, moving a $300 a week payment to those for working rather than for not working. What are your thoughts? So let me see if I've got this straight. We've been paying people too much money and they've chosen to stay home despite the fact that we got over a million job openings and now we wanna pay them to go to work. Um, again, we've offered the governor some ideas on how we can make this transition, make it a, more of a soft landing. For instance, stepping down that $300 per week over the next six weeks, $50 a week, bringing, bringing the real decision-making closer to those folks who are now, frankly, probably making the right financial decision in the short term for their families, but not in the long term. And I think it'd be a mistake to uh, double down on uh, in the government influencing the labor market as we have been doing when it's, and it's, show, it's wrecking, wreaking havoc across the, particularly our small businesses. It's been confounding to watch so many businesses struggle just to stay open because they can't find workers. Uh, uh, Senator, I wanted to make sure we got to something that happened from this past winter. Uh, you caught a lot of heat uh, for calling uh, back in February for suggesting that the narrative around the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol was a hoax, uh, that you didn't feel that it was uh, being framed uh, at all uh, truthfully, uh, that it was Donald Trump supporters. As we've watched the uh, prosecutions of many of these people go forward, that does seem to be exactly what happened. I'm wondering if you've changed your mind over what happened on January 6th, and if you could talk a little bit, you, you also caught some, some grief for meeting with militia members in Michigan, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what the members of the Michigan militia want and what their aims are. Well, those are, those are two complex questions. I've said a lot about the, uh, the, the uh, winter interview that was hijacked, uh, you know, frankly, with all my knowledge. Uh, I don't, I haven't changed my position on that whatsoever. That was a planned event. That part was not a hoax, but I don't believe, and I think it'll be continue to be proven that it wasn't planned by Donald Trump. Uh, in regards to meeting with the militia, I saw a need there to step in. I saw that the, the, uh, the anger, the enthusiasm, the vitriol, the, the loudness of the process and step, stepping in as a leader and saying, okay, what are you trying to accomplish here? Because if you want to be able to continue to represent your uh, constitutional rights, fine, uh, but you're 
frankly, detracting from the message in the way you're doing it. Yeah. And so we had a conversation about how better to deliver that message so that people would feel safe around them and not be turned off by them. Senator, I, I'm out of time. I could talk to you for hours and hours with so many things facing the state right now, but uh, I appreciate you accepting the invitation. Hopefully we'll have you back on, the, on Flashpoint really soon. Very excellent, Devin. Have a great day. You bet. State Senator Mike Shirky, the Majority Leader in the Michigan Senate.